The 6 o'clock news starts right now. We begin tonight at 6 with late breaking news. We don't have a whole lot of information on this right now, but we can tell you San Antonio police responding to a shooting call on the near north side. Yeah, Sky 12 right now over the 700 block of East Mulberry. All of the law enforcement action underneath those trees you see here. This is uh, right near Highway 281. This call for a shooting happened around 520 this evening. We don't have any indication as to the extent of anyone's injuries, whether someone actually was hit or what might have led up to this shooting or potentially where all of this began. But we know the law enforcement there on the scene beneath those trees here along the 700 block of Mulberry. We're going to continue following and bring you any updates as we get them. Meanwhile, our top story at six, two special sessions and a weeks long standoff with Texas House Democrats. Today, Governor Greg Abbott signed the election law that triggered it all. Among the changes, longer early voting hours, ID requirements for voting by mail, and no more unsolicited absentee ballots. Jesse Degollado has reaction from both sides of this highly charged issue. Election integrity is now law in the state of Texas. Supporters witnessing that very moment were elated after months of tension, especially after Texas House Democrats broke quorum trying to stop SB1. But now that it's become law. It ensures that every eligible voter will have the opportunity to vote. So that's what Texas is about, turning out people to vote and making sure the elections are fair and honest and cheaters are caught. Watching it play out were the president of the nation's largest and oldest Latino organization and an East Side voting activist. 5.2 million of us are being called frauds. We are being called cheaters for showing up and voting in record numbers. It's not about protecting voter integrity. There is no voter fraud. That's the big lie. The big truth is there voter suppression. Within minutes of signing SB1 into law, LULAC and others file for a federal injunction to stop it from taking effect claiming it would severely impact communities of color. I'd be astonished uh, if a law like this was not challenged in court. In his uh, words, Governor that Abbott that says he's extremely like confident it'll, it'll be upheld. Likely so, says LULAC's president, by the Republican majority on the high court. But we're going to fight anyway. We always have fought. Worried the new law could hurt voter turnout, Reifert has asked Mayor Ron Nirenberg to make the general election a citywide holiday. There's already council people and the mayor who know about this, but they just need to hear from the rest of the city. Each side firm in their beliefs, yet they agree it's all about the voters. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. A video circulating on social media shows a woman's frustration with pandemic mask wearing. The video shows the woman recording herself following Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf out of a local HEB while calling him names for imposing mask mandates. The video posted on Instagram by the user Ashley Rocks Hair. It happened at the HEB on Northwest Military Highway on Sunday. Putting masks on kids, that's child abuse. He's a traitor, Nelson was a traitor and a communist. And in a statement to KSAT, Ashley explained her video, saying in part, quote, this is far bigger than just Nelson Wolf. We the people need to know who stands for us and not against us. It's unclear if Wolf filed a complaint with the law enforcement agency, but he did release a statement in response to the video. Wolf says, quote, I realize after a year and a half, we are all experiencing COVID fatigue from wearing masks and other public health guidelines. Now is not the time to stop and let our guard down. Our numbers are coming down slowly. Let's keep this downward trend going. Mask up, keep social distance and sanitize, end quote. We reached out to HEB and local law enforcement about this incident, but have not heard back. A man was hit and killed by an 18-wheeler after he jumped off of a downtown overpass this morning. This happened just before 1130 this morning in the area of I-35 in the Brooklyn Avenue exit. San Antonio police say a driver alerted nearby officers to a man waving a large stick. He had a beer bottle in his hand near that overpass. When officers approached the man, he threw the bottle at them. SAPD then called for crisis negotiators and a mental health team. Moments later, the man jumped off the overpass into traffic below where he was hit and killed by that 18 wheeler. The man was pronounced dead there at the scene. Officers at this incident say they don't know why the man jumped. It has been now a little over a month since jury trials were suspended for a second time due to the pandemic. There are a lot of cases being held up because of that. 
But when will those cases go before a judge and a jury? Erica Hernandez has an update on what we can expect this month and into the fall. High-profile cases such as that of Andre McDonald remain on hold. McDonald, who's accused of killing his wife, Andrine McDonald, was expected to go to trial last month. But the latest health protocol issued by Administrative Judge Ron Hell on August 4th is still in place. A lot of folks that go in to get tested are still coming out positive. And so being in that moderate transmission raise still keeps us from considering in-person jury trials. In March of 2020, there was 5,758 total pending cases. Currently, there are 9,303. Now that is a 62% increase, but that number is actually down by 5%. And that is due to the two months of jury trials that did take place this summer, as well as judges being able to virtually move cases along. The judges have really learned how to use technology in a way um, that allows us to process cases efficiently. Um, more than anything, we've had a lot of support from the sheriff, so we're able to do a lot of these hearings remotely through the jail. As the Delta variant continues to cause problems in Bear County, there is no way of telling when jury trials will begin, but Judge Ron Hill is hoping by early fall. I anticipate, based on what local health authorities tell me, if we fall into the medium transmission range, which is possible to happen October, by early October, then we'll consider beginning in-person jury trials. As for that Andre McDonald case, the next possible start date for that trial is October 22nd. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. There is a chip shortage. You might have heard about this by now. Semiconductor chips, and it's affecting a wide range of industries from computers to cars. And those tiny chips can have a huge impact on global economies. Today, Senator John Cornyn and Congressman Mike McCall in San Antonio pushing for more investment into the country's development and manufacturing of those semiconductor chips. Garrett Berger tells us how they hope to make that happen. Whether you're looking for a new or used ride, the current semiconductor shortage has affected the U.S. car market. Because with the chip shortage holding up new vehicle production, there are also fewer used vehicles, affecting the price you pay. I'd say for the last year, um, vehicle prices on the used car market have went up probably 20, 30 percent. But Senator John Cornyn says cars are just one symptom of a larger problem. This is maybe just the leading edge of uh, uh, waking us up uh, to the problem. These ubiquitous chips aren't only in cars. They're in our phones, our jets, or as Cornyn put it, everything with an on and off switch. Speaking today at a roundtable discussion at Tower Semiconductor San Antonio facility, he and Congressman Mike McCall highlighted potential threats to the overseas supply chain. About 90 percent of these are made overseas. Many in, in countries that are vulnerable uh, to our adversaries. So the pair are advocating for incentives to spur the production of those semiconductor chips here in the U.S. The U.S. Senate has already passed a bill that includes $52 billion to that end. The local Toyota plant stands among the supporters of the act. Since a majority of vehicles that, that we manufacture are in the U.S., we think that this could support uh, locally competitive sourcing. The bill's now in the House, where McCall hopes to add a tax credit into the mix, too. Gary Berger. KSAT 12 News. A project promising safety improvements is slowly getting underway in Chavano Park. Our Samuel King joins us now live. Crews are set up along Northwest Military Highway. Samuel. That's right, Tim and Myra. This project started back in July, but it has slowed down a little bit. We'll have more on that in just a bit. Crews are starting with utility improvements there. Residents along Northwest Military between Hebner Road and Loop 1604 are dealing with some of the impacts of the project. Equipment sits close to some driveways and some people's mailboxes were in the way, so their mail delivery has been moved to the municipal complex. Nevertheless, they're hopeful the project will lead to safer driving conditions once it's completed. I'm always looking behind me, you know, putting on my flashers. Um, one day, you know, I just felt it was a little too close, the car coming up. So, you know, I scooted forward just to ensure that they were not going to slam in the back of me. There was a whole bunch of ramp up to this, a lot of concern. And then it was just kind of been sitting there. So uh, uh, certainly once the utilities get done, it'll start moving out a lot faster. And Texas tells us there have been some delays because of the pandemic, both from supply chain issues and crew availability due to COVID-19. Nevertheless, construction is still expected to be completed 
in 2024. Along with that new center turn lane, there will be new sidewalks and bike lanes in the corridor. Let's take a look at traffic this evening. We've been following the situation on the northeast side, but good news within the past few minutes or so. Uh, this crash here at I-35 uh, close to Wigner has cleared up, so that's uh, very good news. Been watching that since the 5 o'clock hour. That icon's still there, but it should go away shortly. Now let's take a look here, northeast side to, uh, to New Braunfels, half an hour right now. So just something to watch out for this evening, guys. All right, well, we have had a hot day, but it's uh, at least it wasn't 100 degrees out there. In fact, our high temperature for the day, 95 for, for the high. That's five degrees cooler than we were yesterday, but at that rate, it really doesn't feel all that much cooler when you're dealing with temperatures in the 90s. Now, tonight, we are going to be mostly clear. There are some showers up in the hill country, but coming up, I'll have a look at the radar, and we'll talk about how we're going to have a stretch of hot days here, but the good news is, low humidity. That's what we're going to hold on to. Your forecast coming up in a bit. Just a few seconds away now from our first COVID-19 briefing of the week. We're expecting to hear from the city and the county about local cases, but especially what's been happening in our hospitals as those numbers continue uh, to be a stressor for our health care system. Let's listen in. County Judge Nelson Wolf, we're joined tonight by our local public health authority, Dr. Jinda Wu, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. This week we have a little bit of good news to share, that is our positivity rate has now dropped to 7.6%, which is uh, following drops in the previous couple of weeks. Consistent with more testing we are seeing in our community, that uh, positivity rate is again uh, good news uh, and going in the right direction. Our case rate has also dropped to 51.2 cases per 100,000. However, our health system score has remained in the upper end of the high stress score after four consecutive weeks at the risk, severe risk level. We're seeing some improvements in our indicators, so our overall risk level has now been modified to moderate. This does not mean we're out of the woods by any means, um, and it does mean that wearing masks, regardless of your vaccination status, as well as getting vaccinated, if you haven't, will help us contain the spread of the virus. Uh, in talking with our hospitals and our STRAC director today, uh, they are still under severe stress, which is a, a concern for everyone in our community, regardless of their COVID status. So let's, let's keep continuing to do our part. Today we are reporting 1,288 new cases of COVID-19. Our seven-day moving average is now 1,222. That number again represents the average daily case uh, rate over the last seven days. Thankfully, we do have no new deaths to report this evening, but we've lost now nearly 4,000 of our friends and neighbors and family members to this disease. So please continue to keep their family and friends in your prayers tonight. There are 1,215 patients in local area hospitals and 176 new admissions in the last 24 hours. 359 patients are in the ICU with COVID-19 and 243 are on ventilators. So still quite high in those numbers. 83% of patients in area, area hospitals are again unvaccinated. 19 patients tonight in local hospitals with COVID-19 are children. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Well, a lot of the numbers are moving in the right direction, but the thing that's still perplexing to me, though, is seeing how many new people are going into the hospital every day. Uh, you know, we were hitting, I think, a high, maybe 190 something, but we're still shooting 172, 162, jumped up to 176. So there, a lot of people are going in the hospital, but obviously moving out fairly quick. Uh, but still, 1,216, that's only a couple of hundred or so below our very high. So there's still some real concerns about what's happening there and, and, and how we can turn it around. So like you say, uh, this is no time to, uh, to let up and, and to be careful of what, about what we're doing. Uh, the schools are still a little perplexing to me also. Um, I know that they're self-reporting every week, and the last numbers I had – uh, we started out at, on August 18th, it was 1,273, then jumped to 5,167, then jumped to 18,111, and then to 27,033 each week, which is a total of over 51,904 COVID cases uh, in schools on self-reporting. And I think we'll have a, uh, probably some new, new numbers for the last week, uh, maybe by the end of this week. So... We're trying to keep a close eye on schools, and, and we want to thank uh, 
all of the school districts that have uh, stood up and say, you got to wear a mask, uh, is, is protecting our children. Everything that we're doing here in, 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 in our efforts is to protect children. That's why we filed the lawsuit. That's why we know from all previous experience that the masks, the social distances, the sanitation uh, protects us. And so, uh, uh, again, thanks to the school districts that are really stepping up and making this happen and protecting the children in their district. All right. Thank you, Judge. And just as we are beginning to gain some control again of this virus, we ask you to continue to do your part because it is making a difference and we are starting to see that now in the numbers. But please do not let up. Again, our hospitals continue to be overloaded. Our medical system is at full stress, so we need to do continue to do our part. Before we go to questions now, I'm going to turn it over. All right, an encouraging update today from the mayor and the county judge uh, talking right off the bat there about our positivity rate that's been cut by more than half in recent weeks. It's now at 7.6%. The mayor did note more testing is being done, uh, but that's certainly a, a big step in the right direction. He also talked about how the risk level for the city, that color coded bar that they show on Tuesdays, it has now moved from the severe category to the moderate category. So when they're looking at all the factors that determine that, it looks like we are headed in the right direction. Certainly not out of the woods yet, as they made very clear, the judge mentioning schools still very much a big concern. Uh, 51,000, ne nearly 52,000 cases since the start of August. Those numbers continuing to go up, but all of those numbers uh, self-reported by those districts. But uh, again, encouraging those schools to continue to ask students to mask up and social distance as much as they can. But uh, no new deaths. That was another positive uh, note that we had today as well. Absolutely. Let's turn to the weather now. Sarah Spivey in for Adam Kasky today. And we've had a lot over these last yeah. 24 hours. It's been hot. We've had storms. Mm -hmm. What yeah. else we got coming our way? Well, we had our first 100 degree day yesterday. Right. Officially, right? Yes. So we got that out of the way, but we've got a few more 100 degree days in the forecast over the next few days. The good news is the humidity should stay low. Let's take a look at the radar right now because we do have some showers and storms out in the KSAT 12 viewing area, not necessarily around San Antonio, but across the Edwards Plateau and the Hill Country. We're seeing a, a, a rain cooled outflow boundary move through Uvalde, but as we're losing the heat of the day, these showers and storms are starting to fall apart. In fact, there was a pretty potent storm just to the east of I-10 in Kerrville uh, in Kerr County, but it's falling apart again as we're losing the daytime heat. Heating. And near Uvalde, there was a shower came so close to Uvalde proper, but instead it fell apart. Meanwhile, across the coastal communities from DeWitt County into Carnes County, there is a heavier shower there as well. But generally around San Antonio, we are not seeing any rain and it's going to remain quiet for the rest of the evening. Looking at the day tomorrow, there is a small, very off chance, 10% for stray shower, but generally it is just going to be hot. Temperatures are going to climb from the 70s to near 100 100 degrees everywhere across the KSAT 12 viewing area. The good news is even though we're going to be at 100, our dew points over the next few days will be in the 50s, which means no heat index in the afternoon. It's going to be a dry heat still, though, awfully hot. And then by the uh, next week, we actually see the uh, some tropical moisture move in and we increase our rain chances. So yeah, looking at those hundreds, pretty scary to see that on the seven day, but we're used to it. We're from San Antonio and South Central. <laughs> Texas. The good thing is low humidity. That's what we'll tell ourselves. Yes, yeah, that's fair. what we'll convince fair. ourselves of that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Greg, UTSA got a big win on the road against a Big Ten opponent this weekend. Now looking ahead to this Saturday. Yeah, and what's interesting is how they did it with a very balanced attack. That running game, very essential, featuring a former Judson Rocket and a former Steel Knight. When we come back, how Brady helped the bunch and UT head coach Sarkeesian talking about playing on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Come here. The UTSA Roadrunners return to practice today following arguably the biggest win in school history. Their 37-30 victory over Illinois on the road this past Saturday. Their first win ever over a Big Ten team and only the second win ever over a Power 5 school. The first being Baylor 17-10 in 2017. Now they shift their focus to their home opener this Saturday in the Alamo Dome when they host Lamar. And one thing they want to repeat is a balanced attack that included 272, 217 yards on the ground led by Sincere McCormick who had 117 yards and 31 carries and two 280 yards in the air. Brendan Brady out of Steel High School is also part of that ground attack with two touchdowns against the fight in the lineup. 
It's a good feeling to just be able to help your team any, anywhere possible. Um, you know, I don't really look at it as far as my uh, individual stats or anything like that. I'm just trying to help the team. Um, and, you know, sincere, he had 30 carries. That's a lot for any guy in college football. Um, and, uh, you know, I just got to tip your hat to him. Just being able to carry basically the offense on his back for 30 carries is incredible. Um, so any chance I get to go in there and just relieve him of that for a little while, you know, I'm going to go out there and give it the, give my all because just that's that's how I've been wired to play. Um, you know, I just I just want to be able to help my team and, and being able to stay healthy and do that for game one. It was definitely huge for me. It was, it was a blessing. Kickoff in the Alamo Dome this Saturday set for 5 p.m. and Kingside 12 Sports will be there. Texas Longhorns will try and make it two in a row to start their season under new head coach Steve Sarkeesian when they face their rivals, the Razorbacks in Arkansas on Saturday. That's after they were able to outscore the Raging Cajuns of Louisiana home last Saturday, 38-18. Now they prepare for their 79th meeting against their old Southwest Conference foes, where the Longhorns were 56-22 and overall in this series and 26-9 and in Fayetteville, where this contest will be held this year. Their meeting, their first meeting, by the way, since 2014 in the Texas Bowl, which Arkansas won that game 31-7. The fact that it falls on the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks does not go unnoticed by Coach Sarkeesian. 9-11 is um, kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, I was working at USC at that time. I was waiting to get picked up to go to work from Norm Chow uh, and had the news on and, and uh, saw it happen. The unfortunate side of it for me, I had a, my cousin was, was in the, one of the towers and, and ended up not making it out. Um, so, um, you know, I think it, uh, it's a, definitely a, a big moment in our history and in our time uh, that we definitely need to recognize. And, um, you know, we, we will, obviously, before this ball game. Kickoff in Fairville on Saturday set for 6 p.m. Like the Longhorns, the fight Texas Aggies will be on the road this weekend when they face Colorado at Mile High Stadium in Denver. That's following their 41-10 victory at home against Kent State this past Saturday. As a result of that and Clemson's loss to Georgia, the Aggies, who have moved up to number five in the nation, are double-digit favorites at 17 and a half points. Haynes King had to overcome three interceptions in his first start as the Aggies quarterback so settled down to throw for 292 yards and two touchdowns. What did Jimbo Fisher think of his performance? The moment was not too big at all. Was totally in the game. Something went wrong. Could walk off and tell you what went wrong, why it went wrong. Could be communicating excellent all night, seeing things. And if we say, you know, with this side here, I thought that coverage maybe she, yeah, coach, I see what you're saying now. Could have come back here. Was excellent in communication. And I, and I thought, I thought, you know, you always wondered it was a moment too big, and it wasn't. And and it really got to test him under duress. Had a couple, you know, you get turnovers. Does that put him in a shell? Nope. Went right back, saw him things, being just as aggressive, doing the things he had to do, and was proud in that regard. Now he gets his first road test Saturday at 2.30, and Bernie has just announced they've had to reschedule their game for the second week in a row due to COVID concerns from Burn It, Darn It, Learn It, and now they're going to play Midland Christian this week. Wow, COVID continues to cause all kinds of problems. Yeah, and we're focused very heavily on it in high school, especially the first yeah. few weeks here. All right, thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. He's known as a champion of children and families. Judge Peter Sakai announcing just minutes ago that he is resigning from the office of the 225th District Court, which he has served in there for nearly 16 years. His resignation letter says in part, quote, when I first ran, I promised to protect children, empower families, and improve the system. Since I have fulfilled my promises, I am ready to embark on a new path of my life. End quote. Sakai has been the administrative judge of the Bear County Children's Court, something he says is his greatest accomplishment. He presided over hearings for foster children without placement. In his letter, he has asked Child Protective Services to remove all foster children sleeping in CPS offices to be placed in safe accommodations. Judge Sakai did not give a specific reason for his resignation. It will go into effect on October 31st. We wish him well. All right, we have a segment coming up, hopefully, on our KSAT Q&A, but we're working out some technical issues right now. So now we want to turn to the latest on COVID around the nation. Yeah, President. Well, Jim, it could go either way, and it's up to us. Four million new COVID-19 cases reported in just the past four weeks. Experts say this is an inflection point as temperatures drop and millions of kids venture back inside classrooms. If we do things right, we hope that we don't see much increase at all. We've got to get the school system masked. Fists are now flying. But remember, there are politicians and parents fighting 
that simple logic. You are all demonic entities. Me, you are going you, to be you, taken excuse down. Excuse me, ma'am. The you Lord already had your first warning, and this is your last. She cannot speak anymore. Meantime, nearly 100,000 Americans are in the hospital fighting this virus, the vast majority unvaccinated. It's sad and sometimes demoralizing. I, I'm not judging patients for making that decision. I really want to empathize, try to understand why they're afraid of the, the treatment, because what they really need to be afraid of is the virus. We have about 75 million people in this country who are eligible to be vaccinated, who are not yet vaccinated. If we get the overwhelming majority of those people vaccinated, we could turn this around. In more than half of states, there is a little dip in average daily cases right now. Will that hold? Last year, there was a post-Labor Day bump. We are having to prepare ourselves for having yet again another surge. This Labor Day weekend, scenes like this. Football fans packed in the stands in Alabama, which has the lowest vaccination rate in the land. In South Carolina, which has the highest infection rate in the land. And in Georgia, where near record numbers are already in the hospital. News around America now. It appears that more people may have died of illnesses related to the 9-11 attacks than those killed in the terror attacks themselves. That's what government officials believe after the Justice Department revealed a special report on the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. The fund was set up for survivors and victims' families in the wake of those 2001 attacks. According to that DOJ report, more than 18,000 people who filed a claim listed 9-11 related cancers as one of their eligible conditions. That is 48% of claims filed. More than 40,000 people have received nearly $9 billion from that federal fund. Nearly 3,000 people were killed on September 11, 2001. To politics now, President Joe Biden is planning to travel to California to campaign with embattled Governor Gavin Newsom as he fights a recall election there. The White House says Biden will visit the Democratic governor early next week. That means he will likely be there at most 24 hours before Election Day, which is on September 14th. It might be too late to garner support because the vast majority of voters are expected to cast their votes early and through mail-in ballots. Meantime, President Biden visiting the Northeast today after historic flooding killed dozens of people there. This has recovery efforts continue in Louisiana following Hurricane Ida's destruction. Daryl Forges with the details. Thank God you're safe. President Biden touring the destruction Ida left behind in New York and New Jersey. His second trip to an area impacted by Ida since it ravaged the East Coast. The losses uh, that we witnessed today are profound. Dozens of lost lives, homes destroyed. The remnants of Hurricane Ida delivered tornadoes, torrential rainfall, and deadly flash flooding last week, killing more than 50 people in the Northeast. My thoughts are with all those families affected by the storms and all those families who lost someone they loved. Officials in the region believe the road's recovery will be long and challenging. I think, sadly, probably months uh, more likely than weeks. Um, and that's the message we've been giving to folks, that this is going to be a long road, but we're going to stand with them at every step of the way. Louisianans also facing a long road ahead. The situation for many remains dire after Ida made landfall as a Category 4 hurricane, bringing winds that wreaked havoc across the state. Hundreds of thousands are still without power, some dealing with much more. Some of the hardest things I've had to deal with is looking people in the face who just have lost everything. Now the president warning that the impacts of recent severe weather nationwide mean climate change requires immediate attention. I think the country's finally acknowledged the fact that global warming is real and it's moving at an incredible pace. And we've got to do something about it. I'm Daryl Ford to supporting. Welcome back, everybody. Have some uh, construction-related traffic news to tell you about right now. Uh, closures resuming at Alamo Ranch Parkway and Westwood Westwood Loop, beginning tonight and tomorrow night, beginning at nine. Here, they're continuing that 
bridge work project uh, out there. So they've been working uh, on this for a little while now, as you know, in this area. So that's going to continue tonight as well. Also, Loop 1604 lane closures in both directions between I-10 and Bandera Road. Also beginning at 9, that is running all week. Some alternating closures, at least one lane will be open at all times. But the ramp to Vance Jackson, that will also uh, be closed uh, this evening because of construction. And that's going to be going on this week as well. Take a look at travel times in that area now. A little bit of red on the map, 21 minutes between 281 and Bandera Road. Again, watch out for that construction later on. Right now, though, things looking fine. Tim and Meyer. Thank you, Samuel. Taking a live look outside with live cam on this Tuesday evening. Uh, looks like some more potential showers there off in the distance. Yeah, that is a storm in Gonzales. So we're looking east about, I would say, 50 miles away from where this camera is. You can see those towering cumulus clouds. We do have some showers and storms on the radar. But time is not in our favor here in San Antonio because as we're going to lose the daytime heating, we're going to see our rain chance go away for the day. Then we've got triple digit days ahead, but a drop in humidity. Plus in the forecast, we're going to be looking at our next best chance for rain within the next seven days or so. I'll have a look at all of this coming up in just a bit. I had people who tell me, well, they're taking people's jobs. Guess what? No, they're not taking anybody's jobs because there's no one is showing up. What they are doing is helping the ones who are really working. A Texas restaurant has apparently found a solution for its labor shortage. Robots, the owner of Laduni in Dallas, says he has a third of the staff that he did pre-pandemic. This is where we are now. And he has tried to hire more staff with no luck, so the restaurant has three robots that work as hosts and runners. They take guests to their tables, bring out the orders, and some even sing happy birthday. I wonder if more people applied for the jobs, would the robots go away? Yeah, they always show up with a good attitude and ready to work. <laughs> and and like until a there's cat. a software problem and, and they, yes. they turn on us. Right, until, <laughs> gotta, you know, you just got to turn them off, turn them back on, right? Yeah, that's, that's right, that's reset. I was thinking of the plot of iRobot there, too. Right? Uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, well, it was hot today, but not as hot as yesterday. Uh, we got to 100 degrees yesterday, famously for the first time so far this year, officially at the airport. Uh, now, what one of the things that I want to talk about really quick is um, we have hit 100 degrees more than just once on, on the south side of town, closer to Stinson. We've hit 100 degrees quite a few times. And if you're thinking, hey, in my backyard, my thermometer reads uh, 105, 106. Well, the official uh, thermometer at the airport is protected and it's in shade, which is supposed to happen for an official reading. So that's one of the reasons why uh, there might be some discrepancies between your backyard thermometer and the official thermometer out at the San Diego Tony International Airport. But today that official thermometer uh, read 95 degrees. That's three degrees above our average high this time of year, 92. But it was a toasty 103 out in Del Rio, 101 in Catula, 100 in Laredo. It was in the low 90s up in the Hill Country. Kerrville topped off only at 92 this afternoon. And Kerrville got a little bit of rain cooled air earlier today. Most of the rain has been limited to the Hill Country and the Edwards Plateau, missing Bear County and the San Antonio metro area. But if we go down to Carnes County, right there near Rungi, we've got a shower. Uh, and in Beeville, uh, in, uh, pardon me, in Bee County, in nor north of Beeville, we've got a shower as well. And then before the break, we were showing that view there of the thunder shower just to the east, uh, west rather, of Gonzales. Again, that's about 34 miles away from uh, northeastern Bear County. Cool that we can see that off in the distance there. Meanwhile, we've got some showers moving into Valverde County. Del Rio, you may just be lucky and get a quick splash and dash shower from the as they move through, but they're running out of time because right when we see the sunset, that's when these showers kind of lose their oomph and fall apart. Now on the satellite picture, as I mentioned earlier, we had some rain up in Kerrville, Lakey, Rock Springs. Those areas are experiencing cloud cover, but it's mostly clear here in San Antonio and out toward Gonzales where we have those showers, just a, a few clouds as well. Uh, and so tonight's going to be mostly clear and quiet around the metro area. Temperatures are going to fall to near 80 degrees by midnight. It's going to be a mild evening. Sunset official time 748 this evening on the radar and satellite. It is quiet across much of the western portion of the United States. There is
is a ridge of high pressure. Of course, high means dry, and the reason for that is the sinking air around a high pressure system. It prevents uh, clouds from developing and thus rain from developing in the vertical. And this high pressure system is going to be moving east and really allowing for us to be dry for the next couple of days. Around this high pressure system, we've also got some serious heat. It's 108 in Las Vegas right now. This is a really cool graphic that I'm showing you. It's the atmospheric moisture content, okay? Basically, anywhere you see these purples and blues, that's very low moisture or very low water content in the atmosphere. And as that high pushes over, we're going to have very low uh, moisture content in the atmosphere over the next few days. So it's going to be dry and it's going to be hot. We're going to be close to 100 degrees. But by the start of next week, Monday, Tuesday, even Wednesday, a fetch of tropical moisture is going to move in from the Gulf sent at best but there is still that 10% chance. So if you are one of the lucky ones to get a little bit of rain, you could also get some gusty winds. And of course, we'll keep our eye on things for you. But again, the chance for rain, very low, 10%. 72 in San Antonio for the morning low. 92 at noon, we'll be spending the afternoon in the 90s, topping off at that triple digit mark, 100 degrees, uh, with a 10% chance for a stray storm. But again, mostly sunny west-northwest winds at five to 10 miles per hour. As I mentioned before the break, we are going to have some drier air in place over the next few days. Dew points are going to be in the 50s. And so even though, yes, it's going to be unbearably hot in the afternoon, 100 degrees, we're at least not going to have to deal with the heat index. That is a plus, and we'll take it in these summer days. Any little thing that can drop the humidity is, is good news in my book. Then on Sunday, those clouds are going to increase ahead of that moisture, and we'll see isolated rain work is back in the forecast. With a little bit more cloud cover and the potential for rain, our highs are going to drop about 10 degrees next Monday and Tuesday. Looking forward there to Tuesday. I think she's saying it's a dry heat. Yeah. Dry is that, heat. Is that yeah. what I'm hearing? <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It's Tuesday, September 7th. Putting masks on kids. That's child abuse. Video circulating on social media showing one woman's frustration with wearing masks. The video is of a woman recording while she's following Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf out of a local HEB while calling him names for imposing mask mandates. He's a traitor. Nelson Wolf's a traitor and a communist. It happened at the HEB on Northwest Military Highway on Sunday. In a statement to KSAT, Ashley reasoned with her video saying in part, quote, this is far bigger than just Nelson Wolf. We the people need to know who stands for us and not against us, end quote. After a months long battle trying to prevent a controversial voting bill from passing in the state legislature, it is now law. Today, Governor Greg Abbott signed off on Senate Bill 1. Those for the bill say it aims to ensure election security. Those against it claim it unfairly targets minority communities in the state. The search continues for a shooting suspect after a woman was shot in the stomach overnight. It was about four o'clock this morning when the victim says three women knocked on her door in the 1500 block of Upland Road. She tells police when she opened the door, a woman shot her. She was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. A pilot able to squeeze a speedy plane through a very tight tunnel near Istanbul. Istanbul, and he set a world record in the process. Here it is, according to pilot Dario Costa, no one had ever attempted to fly through a tunnel before. After more than a year of careful preparations, Costa successfully flew a stunt plane through the tunnel. The pilot and his team had set a new world wow. record. San Antonio police looking for a suspect after an apparent road rage shooting. We told you about this earlier in the newscast as late breaking news. According to officers, someone in a white SUV opened fire on a man in a car driving along Highway 281 a little before 530. The man in that car then drove to the Wells Fargo parking lot and called 911. Police tell us the man suffered non life threatening injuries and the windows of his car were shot out. They did not say whether he had actually been shot or not. Right now, no sign of the SUV involved in the incident. No one else was hurt.
Taking a quick look at traffic, some incidents on uh, the west side uh, right now. Let's start here. This is a say highway 151 at Callahan. A vehicle fire reported there down to 18 miles per hour in that neighborhood. Also on the northwest side, some uh, there's a crash there near Lock Hill Selma and Vance Jackson on 1604. That's that's causing some slowdowns as well. So watch out for that. Also construction overnight at 151 uh, 10 minutes. So that situation's improving. Sarah 1604 at Marbach looking fine right now. And we do have a few spotty showers out there, mainly in Gonzales and Wilson counties, and then a few thunder showers also in Uvalde County near Brackettville and near Del Rio as well. So if you see some uh, thunder off in the distance, here, see some lightning off in the distance, that's the reason why. Brackettville, Del Rio, make sure that if you hear thunder roar, you, you go inside. Now tomorrow we're going to be looking at highs near 100 over the next few days. Lower humidity though, so that's some good news. Increasing clouds early next week with a chance for rain as well. All right, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for watching the News at 6. We'll see you back here for the Night Beat tonight at 10. Until then, have a good evening.